Another funny thing, I had a completely different message yesterday morning. <laughs> I woke up and hated everything about it. It's pretty much the same message, it's just, you know, I got to the same conclusions. I just, the way that I went about it yesterday was totally different. And, 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 I had it all finished, man. It was all finished. It was ready for last week because I screwed up and I had it in my calendar last week that I was preaching. So I was ready to go. And then, and then something screwed it all up last week. So I woke up yesterday morning and I started reading through the passage again and started looking through my commentaries because, like I said, I was pretty unhappy. And uh, it just, it felt like a, like a TED Talk it felt like I was just rambling on about stuff that nobody really cared about. So you know what I did? <laughs> I deleted it all. <laughs> just highlighted the whole thing, off it went. Started again yesterday morning at 10 a.m. It was fun. You want to know what screwed it all up? Patrick Vu. It's all his fault. If you weren't here last week or didn't sign in last week, last week we, uh, we did communion and, and Patrick led us in communion and uh, it was beautiful. It was a, a moment where he like raised a glass and, and he toasted to Jesus. And I've, I have not been able to get it off my mind all week. I woke up, I probably, I would say... I had my vaccine on uh, uh, my booster shot on Monday, so I was home at be in bed for, for Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, for the, well, bed and my lazy boy couch, which is pretty close to the same thing. I sleep there most of the time too. But um, I couldn't get it out of my head. I wake up in the morning and I'm like, toasting Jesus, right? And I'm like, we don't. The problem is, I, I feel like when we, when we do communion, often it's like almost like a funeral possession, a procession to me. It's this mournful thing. It's, it's like, even, like even here at Vox, we do it differently than a lot of places do. Before the pandemic, we would walk up in a line. We'd play some music. We'd walk up in a line. We'd get the elements, and we'd go back to our seat and sit down, and we would take the elements after, you know, doing our prayer and stuff. Like, it was a funeral procession. I felt, I, and, and it hit me. I'm like, what are we doing? Like, like I think I texted uh, Heather and Nathan, and I was like, why don't we do like the night that Patty Murphy died when we celebrate Jesus and do communion? Maybe that's pushing it a little bit too far, right? But, but like, I want to toast him and celebrate him and be excited about that. And, 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 and it took that moment for Patrick to, to, to do that and toast Jesus and, and toast the elements where I was like, man, that just floored me. Floored me. It changed my whole my whole perception of the concept of communion at that moment, right? You guys know, I, I didn't grow up in church, so my only real experience of communion was um, in the Anglican church where, you know, like we would go every weekend twice a year, right? Because that's the only time that you went, Easter and Christmas. And my great-grandmother would drag me out, and it was, it was a very lovely church. It was very boring, <laughs> And I think I have knee pain because of just those two days, just those two days up and down, kneel and pray and stand and raise your hands. No, they don't raise their hands in the Anglican church. Anyways. The night that Patty Bird Murphy died. It's, it's one of those things, that moment when I realized that, when, when I made that connection after Patrick said that, it was one of those things, it's like what John does throughout the book of John that we've been reading, right? There's, there's this little thing that he's going to tell us, and the goal is for us to change our perception and change the way that we look at something, right? So last week, Nathan walked us through the feeding of 5,000, right? Um, and what we often do here at Vox is we try and connect first century uh, Jerusalem, the people from first century Jerusalem, to who we are today. How does this impact us, and does it, does it impact us the same way today as it did back then, right? And I think, and I, and I think we've kind of established this over the last several months, um, the people in first century Jerusalem would have reacted the same way that we react to a lot of the stuff, because they're similar kind of people, right? Jesus all of a sudden feeds 5,000 of us with, you know, three, three uh, fish and five loaves of bread. That's fantastical. That's miraculous. That's 
And I, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm probably going to sit back going, please, sir, can I have some more? Because that was craziness, right? It's crazy. It's a crazy thought to think that three loaves, and, or, or three, three fish and five loaves of bread. Sorry? Two fish. Sorry. Two fish, five loaves of bread. Fed 5,000 people. The other thing that it made me think of, like what Patrick did last week, I w- it made me curious as to why we do things the way that we do it. Okay? And I think the people of first century Jerusalem, when they saw those miraculous things or had a little perception change, they would be curious as well and they would be seeking out and searching for more and following Jesus around. And I think that's one of the reasons why he had such a huge following of people, right? And John does a really good job of connecting um, the story that Jesus is telling, the lessons that he's telling us with their own understanding of the Old Testament, there's a lot of connections between John's, the book of John, and what Jesus does, and the Old Testament. Um, you think about this, Jesus feeds 5,000 people with essentially nothing. It's a very similar image to God feeding the Israelites with manna from heaven, right? That's an interesting connection to me. See, I feel like Jesus is kind of setting up the disciples for something different, for a change, for not just the change in perception, but a change in the world and the way that people are going to interact in the world, right? They, they, they have this manna from heaven story, right? And they're going to make that connection. I think they're going to make the connection between Jesus feeding all those people, at least the disciples will, because they've lived every day for three years or so with Jesus, Right? And last week, Nathan kind of pointed us towards Philip. Philip is my favorite apostle. Um, Philip's kind of this cool guy. So like Jesus, last week, Jesus is talking about asking Philip about uh, how we're going to feed these people. And Philip's like, I don't know, why are you asking me? It would take take a half a year's salary and we wouldn't be able to feed all these people, right? But remember, Jesus already knew what he was going to do. He was just testing Philip. Philip wasn't ready yet. But it sets Philip up for later on in his story in the book of Acts. So th- this week, our passage is no different. It's, it's still that thing where Jesus is leading us towards a change in the way that we see things, right? And, and, and John is trying to make sure that that, that story that, ha- that the disciples learned is passed down to us because it's important. It's, it's, it's foundational in our, in our faith. So we're... we're Jesus walks on water the first time Jesus walks on water because he walks on water twice. John 6, 16 through 25. When an evening came, Jesus' disciples went down to the lake and they got into a boat and were crossing the lake to Capernaum and it was already getting dark and Jesus hadn't come to them yet. The water was getting rough because a strong wind was blowing and the wind had driven, when the wind had driven them out for about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the water And he was approaching the boat, and they were afraid. And he said to them, I am. Don't be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and just then the boat reached the land where they had been heading. And the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the lake realized that only one boat had been there. They knew Jesus hadn't gone with his disciples, but that the disciples had gone alone. And some boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they had eaten the bread over which the Lord had given thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? There's, there's a ton of stuff going on in this. Okay, and, and as I've done over the last several times that I've preached, we're not preaching on one little tiny piece of a passage, right? So I'm, I'm going to rip it apart and we're going to go over it step by step. And I want to point some stuff out, some stuff that I didn't even think about when I first read this passage years ago, okay? Started off, don't forget, Jesus has now gone off into the wilderness to be with his Father and pray again, right? Jesus does this often right before another miracle happens, okay? It's almost like he's got to connect with his Father to make the next step in his, in his journey, okay? Keep that in mind. So we start here, 
my tape fell off. It was driving me nuts. When evening came, Jesus' disciples went down to the lake, and they got into a boat and were crossing the lake to Capernaum, and it was already getting dark, and Jesus hadn't come to them yet. And the water was getting rough because a strong wind was blowing, when the wind had driven them out for about three or four months. First thing that I realized. Ah, thank you. Very helpful. Okay, so first thing that I realized. Um, it says it was getting it was already getting dark and Jesus hadn't come to them yet. I've been struggling with whether or not I wanted to talk about this point all week because I found it weird. Just the language of it was kind of weird. Why would they be waiting for him out on the water? They already left. They know he's back there. I don't have an answer for that. It's just weird to me. Right? One of the translations that I read said that they were expecting him. They're weird, right? I haven't figured that one out yet, and none of my commentaries that I currently pay, have paid for tell me what the answer is. I'm hoping maybe somebody can send me an email what they think. I don't know. What, what do you think? What do you think? Why, why would they be waiting for him out there? Maybe they were waiting for him on the other side. Maybe they're expecting to meet him on the other side. I don't know. That's one thing. Another thing. Um, so we have a boat full of fishermen out on the Sea of Galilee where these people, these, these guys probably fished, okay? They're pretty comfortable out there and they're out three or four miles which um, is the, about the halfway mark, okay, between one side and the other, okay? The, they, they say, um, it says that uh, the Sea of Galilee is about eight miles at its widest point and in uh, the rainy season, the highest level is about 141 feet deep. This is a pretty significant inland lake, right? And, and it would fluctuate. It would go up and down between like 80 feet deep and 140 feet deep. That's pretty significant. And the Sea of Galilee is kind of at the bottom of this bowl. So you end up with huge storms and winds that would just rip up like crazy out of the blue. Here in Ontario, we have Lake Superior and there's, there's all these stories about um, like songs, like uh, fishing songs and stuff like that where they talk about Lake Superior being this dangerous lake because uh, uh, it, it creates its own weather patterns. Like a whole, a whole storm will just rip up. Well, the Sea of Galilee is the same way. So they were pretty cautious. And they're out four, three or four miles because the wind blew them out there. They're heading towards there, right? And they're on rough seas. And then Jesus comes walking across the rough seas. He's not standing on a sandbar, He's just walking nonchalantly towards the boat and everybody freaks out, right? They saw Jesus walking on the water and he was approaching the boat and they were afraid and he said to them, I am, don't be afraid. So like, Jesus walks towards them and they all freak out, right? Philip points across at water, across the water, Jesus in shock, right? And, 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 and John's scared and he's glad that he brought himself a new pair of underwear, right? And, and then you have, uh, Peter's like, oh my God, and Jesus is like, yep, I am, right? There's this obvious moment where we're talking about Jesus' divinity. That's pretty clear, and a large, pretty much every single miracle can point towards that, right? But there's more going on here. It says, they, they, saw, Je they saw Jesus walking on the water, blah, 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 where am I here? Um, yeah, it's, it, I am is a direct connection to God in the Exodus story. Exodus 3, God calls himself I am, right? The disciples are picking up on this. They wanted to take him into the boat, and just then, the boat reached the land where they had been heading. Okay, well, they're in the middle of the lake, in rough seas, three or four miles out, and then they're on land, <laughs> Teleportation is a spiritual gift. Did you know that? Yeah, suddenly. Colin Cruz, in, the, in his commentary, uh, John, in introduction, says, it seems the evangelist wants us to see in this immediate arrival in Capernaum a further miracle. Miraculous transportation is important. We have another story about that in the Bible. Remember Philip? Acts 8, 39 through 40. When they came up, oh, sorry, this is uh, Philip walking down the road to Jerusalem and he comes across the Ethiopian eunuch, 
Right? You know that story. Everybody knows that story. When they came up out of the water, the Lord's Spirit suddenly took Philip away because Philip was baptized in the Ethiopian eunuch. And the eunuch never saw him again. And he came away, went away rejoicing. And Philip found himself in Azotus. He traveled through that area preaching the good news in all the cities until he reached Caesarea. Suddenly took Philip away. The Lord's Spirit suddenly took Philip away. Like Nathan said, I think Philip was ready because of what just happened. He didn't want to be left out. He wanted to be part of the story. The next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the lake realized that only one boat had been there. And they knew Jesus hadn't gone with his disciples, but that the disciples had gone alone. The crowds knew something was weird. They were there for the, fi- for the feeding, right? They knew something was different. They'd been following him around, watching him do all these crazy miracles, right? And, and John seems to stress that not only did the disciples see what was happening, the crowds were puzzled about it too. They were trying to figure this whole thing out. They had some connections. Were they clear connections yet to them? Because they're only getting little bits and pieces. I don't know. Right? And it says, some boats came from Tiberias near the place where they had eaten the bread over which the Lord had given thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? They don't understand how Jesus could have got from one place to the next so quickly. They, can't, they don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. He would have to walk all the way around because there was no other boats, right? So he's got to walk on land all the way around the lake, right, the inland sea, to the other side. And he's there before they're there, and they took a boat across. N.T. Wright says this, but we listen through the roar of the waves. I love the way that this man writes. But we listen to the roar of the waves and the wind. We may hear the voice that says, it's me. Don't be afraid. And if we are ready then to take Jesus on board, we may find ourselves sooner than we expected at the harbor where we will calm and secure, where, where we will be calm and secure once more. And then he goes on, he says, the whole of this long sixth chapter of John's gospel is dominated by the theme of Passover, or rather by one aspect of Passover, the fact that God fed the children of Israel during their wilderness wanderings with bread from heaven. I could preach a whole message just on that passage, just on that thing that N.T. Wright says, because it's fascinating, right? Like, think about this for a second. He, he, he connects it with wilderness wanderings, the Israelites being lost in the middle of nowhere. Aren't we lost in the middle of nowhere somewhere, sometimes? Right? I think there are times for sure. I know I am. I was feeling pretty lost after my booster shot on Tuesday. Remember, Jesus fed 5,000 to 10,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. The disciples just saw it. But then they were shocked and terrified when Jesus comes walking across the water. Why is, it such a, why is it such a leap? Why would they? I don't understand. It's that walking on water is another foundational point for Acts. Right? We know that later on, we have this, this, this picture of Peter being called out into the water with Jesus to go walk in the water with Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't want to walk on the water by himself. He calls them all out. Peter's the only one that gets out of the boat. And he takes a couple steps before he starts sinking because he's like, I'm walking on water, what's happening? And then he starts to sink. And Jesus is like, you don't believe enough yet. I have this great picture, and I missed, I missed the opportunity. I have this great picture that's my wallpaper on all of my computers and pretty much all my devices. And it's, this, it's taken from the viewpoint of looking up underneath the water and Jesus reaching his hand in the water to pull me out. Man, I wish I had to put that up there on the screen to show you guys because it's, it's fantastic. 
This passage is not just about walking on water, though, right? It's not that Jesus wants us to walk on water. That's not the point. Cool trick, cool parlay trick. You imagine that? Hey, we're going to go to a party over at uh, Dave's place or in Bev's place, and uh, hey, watch this. Right? Or like, I like that, I like that uh, there was a great picture on Facebook that went uh, um, around, a, I don't know, a couple of years ago, where some guy dressed up like Jesus and started running across Lake Simcoe. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. I, I like that one. Jesus isn't preparing us for cool parlor tricks. It's not the point, right? Jesus is preparing the disciples for a new thing, a new way of doing life. But he doesn't give us all the answers all at once, right? It's not like, um, here's the playbook. Go figure it all out. Here's the step-by-step -step how to do everything. What I was originally going to show you guys today was more, more technology that I work on. I was, like, was going to be like, look how cool this one is. And then see this one, this one's really cool. And then I was going to walk you through a little step by step. And then I was like, this is stupid. Jesus doesn't give us all the answers. He only gives us little bits and pieces, what we can handle. Right? And this is, this is the sanctification story. When, when Patrick, I totally was like, yeah, yeah, communion, communion. We, we need to remember what Jesus did for us. It's so sad. Somebody once said that uh, um, the, the I'm trying to remember how it goes, the greatest act that a person can possibly do is to fight for another person. I was like, I don't know if I like that or not. Maybe, maybe the greatest act a person can do for another person is to sacrifice. When Patrick said that we need to toast Jesus and celebrate Jesus, I was like, yeah. My whole view changed. That's part of the sanctification story. Is Jesus doesn't want, doesn't want to just have us remember his death. Right? That's why he came back, too. One of the reasons. So we're part of this story, and it's, and, and it's a long story, right? It, it, we, we often look at, like, a Bible timeline like, like this, right? Yeah. So like, we, you know, we have in the beginning, creation of Eden, the fall of man, then there's a flood, Abraham, then some Moses dude comes up, then there's David, who's like a warrior guy who kills giants and stuff like that with rocks, and then we have Babylon, and then there's silence, right? We don't hear from God for a couple hundred years. And then Jesus' birth, Jesus' ministry, then his death. You're not meant to read the pieces, stop looking, I'm telling you what it says. Then there's his return after his death. Triumphant. And then the ascension, more triumphant. And then there's the acts of the disciples, where they go off and they're trying to live what Jesus taught them to live. And then we have Revelation. And Revelation is this kind of little window into the end, to the new beginning, to something that I'm not going to preach about today because it's too long. But our timeline, our, our Bible timeline, looks like that. Looks like this. You're here. I used the dot, and I, I did this when we were in Pathways, where I was getting a little bit frustrated with some of the students because it was like, you're not telling me you're part of the story. When you look at a timeline that you're part of, I can look ahead for what I think it's going to look like, and I can turn around and look, what it, look at what it was before. Look at my history and how I got here. That is the Bible timeline that we look at. You are part of the story. I am part of the story. We are part of the same story that the disciples were part of. And it doesn't end today, right? It goes on tomorrow. And every time you pick up a book, you're going to read something and it's going to change your perspective, 
or you hear somebody up here talking or, you know, your friend next door talking to you about something and they're like, hey, you know, I never thought about this. A part of the story is just as exciting as, as we're willing to let Jesus in the boat and allow him to steer us to the coast. Because it matters to us and to those around us, right? If we take Jesus on board and start walking with him and try and follow him and chase him, it matters. It makes a difference in the lives of the people around us. It makes a difference in our lives. At least it should. That's the point. I came down pretty heavy on everybody, you know, last time I preached. A little bit guilty, a little bit guilt, guilt, guilt ridden. I not feel good about it afterwards. That's some really nice messages from people, though. It was kind of cool. I came, uh, I let uh, my own personal struggles kind of slide into my message last time I preached. Oops. Part of the story. But I want, I want to celebrate Jesus. I want to celebrate Jesus in, in, when we take communion together. I want to celebrate Jesus when I do business. That's a hard one, right? It's just business. Bullshit. I mean... You know, it's not just business. It's not just business, right? I want to celebrate Jesus when I parent my children. Does my parenting look like Jesus? Nope. Quentin's up there going, well, trying, right? I want to celebrate Jesus in my marriage. I want to celebrate Jesus in all aspects of my life. I want to celebrate Jesus so much and start looking like him so much and have him with me so much that if I get bit by a mosquito, that little bugger goes off flying away saying there's power in the blood of Jesus. Looking to get baptized. That's what I want. Is that too much to ask for? (laughs) I had to look up a song to make that fit because I didn't have one. (laughs) Screaming at the top of his lungs, there's power in the blood. I'll invite everybody to come back up.